cast my mind to Calvary, where Jesus bled and died for me. I see his wounds, his hands, his feet, my Savior on that cursed tree. His body bound and drenched in tears. They laid him down in Joseph's tomb. The entrance sealed by heavy stone. Messiah still and all alone. to know that we have a hope that other people don't have. We shall rise with him again. Because he rose, we will rise. He shall return in robes of white. The blazing sun shall pierce the night and I will
I promised that we were going to have communion today. And so I want to, uh, as we're preparing for that, I just uh, want to um, share some things out of Isaiah chapter 53. But I'm going to be in 52 first, starting with uh, verse 13. Isaiah 52, 13. You know, the, uh, this whole uh, place in the scripture, you know, it has to do with, um, with Jesus. And um, way before the Messiah came, as a matter of fact, uh, the Jewish people don't even want to read the book of Isaiah 53. A lot of times they don't want to accept the fact that it points to Jesus, okay? The suffering Messiah, but this whole chapter does. Uh, Isaiah 53, but we're going to be in 52 because that's where it really first starts, is in verse 13. A lot of people say it starts in 53, but it really starts 52, 13. And, um, and I just want to share a couple things in fifth, chapter 52 before I really focus on what I really want to look at, okay? And um, I'm going to say a prayer before um, I read God's word. Father, uh, though we're not a big group here today, uh, you're still here. And, and uh, God, it felt so good just to worship you uh, in a personal way with that song, rather than uh, say it, to just include you in the room when we're singing. And, uh, and sing into you in the first person, because you are here. And uh, Jesus, I pray that you help me. Help me, God, to share the things you want me to share in your word as we're just preparing uh, for communion today. And, uh, and God, open up our hearts, Lord, so that we can uh, just take a moment and appreciate what you truly did for us on that cross. And I want to thank you for Isaiah chapter 53. Thank you for that. And, and once again, I pray that your Holy Spirit will just um, bring everything to light and to life and uh, so that we can Look at Jesus and the wonderful sacrifice you made for us. And I ask you this in Jesus' name. Amen. So in verse 13, it says, Behold, my servant will prosper. You know that, that word servant. So he didn't come as a king. You know, and this was a prophecy way before he came. And he came as a servant, serpent, servant, you know, in a humble way. You know, he came to serve us, you know. He came not as a heavenly king, but he came to, to, to die on that cross. But he was a servant, a suffering servant. And it says, and he will be high and lifted up and greatly exalted. See, he's coming as a servant. He's coming to do the will of the Father, right? But not, uh, he's coming to do the will of the Father, but it also says he's going to be high and lifted up. And you know, the Bible says, you know, in John chapter 3, it says, if we lift up the Son of Man, he will draw all men unto himself and not only that but after he died he rose from the grave right and he's victorious and you know it was prophesied 
that he will be high and lifted up. And now, where is he? Where is Jesus? He's seated at the right hand of the Father, right? That's where he is. So, you know, the victory is won, right? And, you know, the resurrection is proof that what he did on the cross is real. It's proof. If he didn't rise from the grave, we would have to doubt everything he did on that cross for us. But it was prophesied way before Jesus showed up on this earth through Isaiah, inspired by the Holy Spirit. Because why? why? The Holy Spirit's eternal, right? He was, he is, and he is to come. That's the Holy Spirit. So the Holy Spirit, being eternal, he knows in the future, okay, this Messiah is going to come and he's going to do what he's supposed to do to redeem us, right? Of all our sins. But look, so he'll be high and lifted up. But then it says, just as many, this is verse 14, just as many were astonished at you, my people, okay? You're talking about the Jewish people now. And he's saying, just as the people were astonished at you. Now, the Israeli people, okay, people of Israel, the nation of Israel, they didn't really look like a whole lot. It didn't look like much, okay? And they always, God always used them, right? It, was, it seemed like he always diminished his armies, their armies, so that he could get the glory. They were always outnumbered. They were always this, always that. But, you know, and I think it was in the divine plan of God. You know, the world was looking at them like, hey, you're not much, okay? But they were astonished at what God could do, Right? Kind of like what just happened, you know, uh, in Israel with all the rockets going on and how uh, the same thing happened, right? God showed his glory through uh, giving uh, Netanyahu and also the general some wisdom, right, on how, how to have minimal collateral damage and and re remove some of the terrorists that are trying to terrorize them, right? And they all died in, the uh, in their tunnels, right? It, but see, God, he shows his glory like that. Though they're small, okay, the, you know, many were astonished at you. Many are astonished at Israel and the glory that God puts, right? But he says, so his appearance was marred more than any man. Now he's talking about what the Messiah looked like after, you know, after he was hanging on that cross. You know, he was so beaten for us, okay, that they couldn't even recognize him. He, he was beaten that bad. More than any other man. That's what the Bible says. You know, and I, watching the passion of the Christ, you know. Uh, the part that really hits me the most is when they're whipping him and he's holding on to that post, right? And that cat nine tails are coming to rip him apart. And the Bible says, you know, he was so marred more than any man and his form more than the sons of men. And then at verse 15, it says, he will sprinkle many with nations. Now, we could bypass that, but that word sprinkle means cleansing. And if you were to research that word out, and I did, okay, and this is the Hebrew word for it. It's called nazah. That's the Hebrew word for sprinkle in that place. And it means to spurt, to spatter, to sprinkle. And it's referring to the blood he's going to shed on the cross. For cleansing purposes. And it was prophesied way before Jesus did that. See, you know, because back then, the priests, that's what they used to do. They used to do all this cleansing, right, in the temple. Like, I'm reading Leviticus in my own personal devotional time now. 
And that seemed like a book like, man, I can't wait till I'm done Leviticus because, boy, this book is like repetitive. It's this, it's that, right? But there's a lot of things in there that show us the value of the blood of Jesus. And, you know, the sprinkling, they used to do that to get, make everything clean, you know, with hot, you know, with a plant. They'd spatter the blood everywhere around in that tabernacle. But, you know, that wasn't enough. But Jesus was going to come, and his blood was going to come to sprinkle many nations, it says. You know, the blood sprinkled the nations, sprinkled all of us, the blood. And it makes us clean. It makes us whole, don't it? And it says kings will shut their mouths on the account of him. For what they had not been told, they will see. For what they had not heard, they will understand. You know, and, and that is really talking about, you know, there's three places in a New Testament, okay? There's three places in a New Testament that Isaiah 53 is quoted, okay? And, and it's re really referring to 15 and then Isaiah 1. 53 1 it says who has believed the message our message and whom is the arm of the Lord been revealed okay all of that goes together you know after the sprinkling the prophecy of that cleansing that's going to happen it says kings are going to not, not know what to say and people are going to understand they're going to see and they're going to know okay that's what the Bible says. And we get that understanding from the Holy Spirit, don't we? Don't we get that understanding from the Holy Spirit? Absolutely. And it was prophesied that, you know, what they haven't been told and what they haven't heard, they're going to see and understand. But then in verse, who believes our message? That's what it says in verse 1. And I was talking about how, you know, different places it was fulfilled you know isaiah 53 was mentioned in the new testament and this is one of the times it's in john chapter 12 and it talks about this is where they rejected jesus you know the priest and the pharisees and uh when he came he didn't come in a way they expected him to come okay they didn't expect him to come as a suffering servant. They expected him to come in a different way, the Messiah. And in verse 37 of John 12, 37, it says this, But though he had performed many signs before them, they were not believing in him, for that the word of Isaiah, the prophet, might be fulfilled, which is spoken, who hath believed our report? And to whom has the arm of the Lord been revealed? See? And, and it was quoted in the book of John that they were going to reject him. They weren't going to re recognize him. And really, it's because he came. He came in a way that wasn't relevant to the world or to these people that were powerful. Or these people that were looking for status. Okay, Jesus wasn't about status. Was he? Matter of fact, he took the form of a servant. So that we could be saved. Right? He took the low side. Didn't he? And, and that's why they rejected him. He came in a way they didn't expect him. And then it was quoted in John about that. And if you keep reading in John, verse 39, it says, they caught, For this cause they could not believe. For Isaiah said again, He had blinded their eyes, he hardened their heart, lest they see with their eyes and perceive with their heart and be converted and heal them. And I read that a minute ago in Isaiah 52 at the end. That though they don't hear, they will hear. Right? And they will see. Right? But see, they were blinded because he came in a way they didn't expect him. You know, a lot of people think the cross is 
foolishness, right? That's what Paul says. The cross is foolishness to the world, right? But for us, it's salvation. It's salvation. And a lot of people think, why can something like that? It's too simple to be saved. You know what I mean? Uh, Do you ever hear people say that? Or how, how about us? Sometimes we could feel like, ah, oh, boy, I'm justified because of my faith, okay? Do you know that's hard to accept that truth? A lot of times we want to add things to that because we feel the work of the cross isn't good enough. In our own minds, sometimes we feel like, I got to do this, I got to do that, I got to do the other thing in order to really be justified, okay? We have a hard time to accept that the work at the cross was enough for us. Isn't that true? You know, and and I want to get back to Isaiah. Back to Isaiah 53. You know, verse 2, it says, he grew up before them like a tender root. So here he is. And it's talking about Jesus again. He grew up before them. He grew up. And he was a tender root. And, and then he gives it a compare, it, it get, tells us what kind of root that was. A root out of a parched ground. And you know what? Because of the curse, everything is parched. And he came to bring life. And even the dirt, okay, like I'm, I'm, in, a, I'm in garden mode right now, okay? Uh, I'm thinking about my garden. I'm thinking about flowers. Maybe some of you are thinking the same thing, okay? Well, like my daughter asked me some advice, and she asked me, what should I do, you know? You saw what my garden looked like, you know? <laughs> what should I do this year to make it better, right? And I told her, you got to feed the soil. You know, make sure you feed the soil with some good manure or some good fertilizer, whatever it is, okay? Make sure you feed the soil. Well, over here, it says, this root came out of a dry ground. He didn't get no life from the soil. You know why? He is the life. Now, we got to think about that. He is the life that came into a sin-cursed soil that can't give us any life at all, okay? He's not dependent on the soil. He's not dependent on the world. He's not dependent on any of this, okay? He is self-sufficient in his life, okay? He's the life that came out of that dead soil, that tender root. And again, that shows me, like in verse 1, where it says, you know, he had a strong arm, an arm of the Lord be revealed, right? And that's talking about the power of the Lord. See, he has the power. He has the power to be able to do what man can't do because we all have a problem. Every one of us has a problem, and it's called sin, okay? But this root came out of a parched ground. He came, you know, he was put on this earth, right? And he came in a humble beginning, in a manger, right? (laughs) In a humble beginning, in a manger. For one purpose and one purpose only, to die on that cross for us. That was his mission. Because he knew that we had a problem. We had a problem. So I want to skip down a little bit because I I could really break this whole chapter down, but I won't for time purposes, and I want to spend some time in communion. But I want to, what I really want to look at, all right, I'm going to start with verse 3, and I'm going to go right down to verse 5, okay? And I'm going to read it first. It says, He was despised and forsaken of men, a man of sorrows, acquainted with grief, like one 
from whom men hide their faces. He was despised, and we did not esteem him. Surely our griefs he himself bore, and our sorrows he carried. Yet we ourselves esteem him stricken, smitten of God, and afflicted. But he was pierced through for our transgressions. He was crushed for our iniquities. The chastising of our well-being fell upon him. And by his scourging, we are healed. Now, some versions say by his stripes, we are healed. We are healed. That's present tense. That's not past tense. We are healed. Now, I just want to throw in a couple things that I wrote down here. You know, griefs and sorrow, okay? That's what I read, right? Verse 3, it says, He was despised, forsaken of men, a man of sorrows and grief. Do you know, that really doesn't give us justice to those two Hebrew words, okay? <laughs> Grief and sorrow, it means more than that. And some people will interpret it to mean, okay, that Jesus didn't come to provide physical and emotional and spiritual healing. It was for sin and sin alone. But it go means more than that. If you were to search that word out, grief and sorrow, okay? The word grief, the, the word is coli. That's what, it, that's what the Hebrew word is. And it really means sickness. It's interpreted for sickness. So it goes deeper than sin. It goes for sickness, too. Sickness and disease. And disease is a disorder of a function that our body's supposed to have, whatever that is, okay? That's what a disease is, something that's not functioning properly. That's what it means. And sorrows, it has to do with pain. That's what it means, sorrows. The word is macabre, the Hebrew word. So... When Jesus died on the cross, he did not only die for our physical needs, but also our spiritual needs. And that's so important that we know that. You know, in verse 3, at the end of that, it says he was despised and we didn't esteem him. Do you know the father even didn't look at him? when he was hanging on that cross, when he had the fullness of sin on his body, and he was that perfect sacrifice. Remember when he said, my God, my God, why has thou forsaken me? See, people didn't esteem him, but the Father couldn't look at him either because he was the sin of the world. He became sin for us, right? So that we don't, you know, the, the book of 2 Corinthians tells us, he, for he knew him, for he made him who knew no sin to be sin on our behalf that we might become the righteousness of God in him. He did that for us. And to a point that the father couldn't even look at him. <laughs> and then verse 4 there's a lot in here to unpack. And we don't really think about the fullness of what he did on that cross, okay? And this is, it's going to tell us. Surely our griefs, there's that word grief again, okay? Which is pain, right? Surely all our pain he himself bore. And that word bore, you know what that means? He carried it for us. He carried our heavy burdens for us. He took it all. He carried it because he knew we couldn't carry it. He knew we couldn't do it. He knew we were powerless to do it. So you know what? 
He took our pains. He carried them. He carried our load. And you know, when he carries our load, what does it do for us? It gives us freedom. Don't it? It gives us freedom. I remember when I first got saved. When I first got saved, I remember I felt like 100 pounds got taken off my shoulders. I, was, I had the whole weight of the world on me. You know? And my sin and all that, right? But when... I came to that cross. Jesus took that whole burden. He bore. He bore all that pain for me. He carried it for me. He's carrying it for us so that our walk can be light. You know what I'm saying? We don't have to carry the world on our shoulders. We don't have to wear, carry guilt and condemnation on ourselves. He's carrying all that for us. Right? He bore it for us. Praise God for that. In our sorrows, back to that word sorrow again, which is, okay, sickness and disease. It says, our sorrows he carried. <laughs> he carried those things too. So he carried all that and he lifted all of that off of us. Praise the Lord. Isn't that awesome? I don't know, but when someone's sick, right? Let's say physically sick or emotionally sick or whatever it might be, okay? That they're, uh, they're not feeling good. You know what I mean? They don't feel good and emotionally they're, they're, they're going through a lot of stuff, but Jesus is carrying all of that for us. And he did it at the cross. And he can help us through whatever it is. He can heal us and he can help us through all that emotional mess that we go through. Whatever it might be, right? Because sometimes, you know, things happen, right? In our life. And all of a sudden everything changes and, and that's a burden for us. And we have to learn how to uh, navigate through this new thing that, you know, the curse brought upon us, right? Right? But Jesus is there to carry all that for us and to lift our burden. We don't need to be burdened down. Jesus is carrying that for us. He carried it. Hallelujah, right? But look at this. Verse 5. You know, verse 5 is amazing to me, okay? And it says he was pierced through. So this, these are some of the things that Jesus did for us. Other than our griefs and our sorrows, this is what else the cross did for us, okay? And, and it's specific. It, 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 these are specific things. The wounds that he took, brought specific results. Okay? Now let's look at that. His piercing, he was pierced, okay? For what? What was the piercings for? And what does transgressions mean? Revolt, rebellion, trespasses. That's what it means. We trespass against God when we sin, right? Right? We can trespass against one another. And Jesus, his wounds, okay, he took those wounds on so that we can have reconciliation every place that we have trespassed or been trespassed against, right? See, because God wants us to be at peace with him in the area of relationships, and peace with one another, right? And all those wounds were because he needed to provide what we needed when trespass happened. You know what I'm saying? So the piercing is for transgressions. Then it says he was crushed. 
And, and he was crushed to a point that nobody could recognize him, right? But what was he crushed for? This is the result for that. He was crushed for our iniquities, our sins. You know, he was unrecognizable because of our sins, our shortcomings, our faults, evil doings, okay? Those kinds of things. That's why he was crushed. So he was pierced for trespasses. He was crushed for our iniquities, our sins. And you know what? There's no sin he didn't die for. That's how come he was unrecognizable. Because all those wounds were going to cover every sin that anybody could ever commit. Now, that's pretty cool to me. And then it tells us that chastising of our well-being fell upon him. You know what chastising is? It means discipline, reproof, warning, instruction, a rod of discipline. Okay? That's what it means. And he took all of that punishment, okay, so that we could get peace. He took all that discipline for us because sin needs to be disciplined. The law, right, states that sin needs to be disciplined. And he took all that discipline so we could have peace. Glory to God, right? And in this version, it says well-being fell upon him. It's for our well-being. You know, so that we can say it is well with our soul. That we could be at peace with God. And I remember before I became a Christian, one of the things that happened right away for me is I was a very anxious person and I was worried about everything. I really was. I weighed 120 pounds soaking wet because of anxiety, really. That's where I was at. But when I got saved, okay... <laughs> The anxiety was gone. And I got peace in my life. A peace that passeth all understanding, that can rule in your heart and your mind, right? And, and you can say, it is well, it is well, it is well with my soul. It is well. Peace. Peace. And he took that discipline for us so that he can trade us with peace. <laughs> now that is awesome to me. The world, you know, people are striving after so many things in this world to find happiness, right? We can buy a mansion someplace or whatever it is that we think we need to be happy, okay? Okay but it can never outdo the peace that we get from God and the love that we experience from God, right? Those things are priceless. And there's a lot of people that have no peace, but we're not going to have peace without Christ. And he took that discipline so that we could have peace. You remember the angels announcing when Jesus was born? Peace on earth and goodwill towards all men. Right? The Lord is here. And now, now there's going to be peace in this parched land that can't provide that peace. This root is going to come out that has the life that can do that. Right? Right? Thank you, Jesus. And then, the last thing. His scourging or his stripes, his whippings, okay? 
It provides healing. Healing. Healing to us. You know, in the curse, Adam and Eve, they fell. But in the curse, there's a lot of stuff that we face almost every day because of the curse. It's true. I'm more and more convinced, okay, and we're almost at that place, okay, mosquito season. I don't like mosquitoes, okay? But I believe that mosquitoes are part of the curse. So next time you do that, okay, that's part of the curse. We're not going to be doing that anymore, okay? But we all experience results of the curse that came in the garden. And it comes in a lot of ways. Let's say someone we love dies, right? We feel the sting of death, right? Or someone who is sick. We weren't created to, die, to be sick. We weren't created to die. We weren't created to be uh, maybe betrayed by somebody or whatever it might be, okay? All of those things are a part of the curse. And the former things are going to be remembered no more. That's what Jesus said, right? But he made everything right at the cross. This is where he hit the reset button in a sin-cursed world for all of us. And he did that because he loves us. Right? No, that part that I read, the fulfillment of that prophecy, it was mentioned earlier. I said there was three places in the New Testament that Isaiah got mentioned. Now this one here was in Matthew chapter 8. Right after he healed Peter's mother-in-law at her house, he had a revival service at the, in the evening after the Sabbath day. You heard me preach about that. And then it says, in, in verse 16, Matthew 8, 16, it says this. And when evening had come, they brought many who were demon-possessed and he cast out the spirits with the word and healed all who were ill. In order that was spoken through Isaiah the prophet might be fulfilled, he himself took our infirmities and carried away our diseases. See, now this is a proper interpretation of griefs and sorrows. It was mentioned in the New Testament. And when Jesus had those healing services, those revival services, okay, like he was doing, that's what he was doing. He was doing battle with the devil, okay? He was doing battle, setting people free. Setting people free, casting out devils. He was doing all of that. And Isaiah was being fulfilled. When that happened. And you know what? Jesus isn't on earth anymore. But this is still continuing. Because the blood is sprinkled around the nations. Okay? The blood is still here. He left the blood for us. And the blood will do battle. Bring healing. Bring life. And there ain't no devil that wants to be around it. They don't like the blood of Jesus. They don't like it. They don't like Jesus, and they don't like the blood. So it's sprinkled all over the nations. I thank God for the blood is as fresh today as it was the day he shed it. It never dried up. And it's a gift he left behind for us. Thank you, Jesus. In the third place that it got mentioned in the New Testament. 
And I'm going to skip right down to verse 12. It says, Therefore I will allot him a portion with the great, and he will divide booty with the strong. Because he poured himself out to death, he was numbered with transgressors. And again, look at, yet he bore the sin of many. There's that word bore again. He carried our burdens, right? But look where he is. He's numbered among the transgressors, right? And who did he have on the side of him? Two thieves, right? Two thieves. And those thieves really represent us. And he was not... So he came right in our playing field to set us free. We were all transgressors until we found Jesus, right? But he was numbered among them. And so he had to come among us in order to save us, right? And then Jesus, the, the, where it was mentioned in the New Testament, Luke 22 it says this. You know, they were fighting on who the greatest was going to be. That's what they, you know, John and James, they were fighting over that. And I'm going to start with verse 36. 22, 36. And he said to them, but now let him who has a purse take it along. See, because he's talking about he's going to be gone, but... He's given them instructions on what to do after he's gone. Likewise, also a bag. Let him have no sword. Who has no sword, sell his robe and buy one. For I tell you that this is which is written must be fulfilled in me. He was numbered with transgressors for that which refers to me has its fulfillment. So Jesus is proclaiming right here that what you're about ready to see me do on the cross is a fulfillment of Isaiah chapter 12. I mean, 53, 12. Okay? That's what he's saying. And when I'm gone, right, he told him, oh, you might want to sell your purse for a sword. Why? Because you're going to be in a place, okay, that... You're not going to be liked. But we don't need to fight our battles like that, right? we got Jesus helping us. Because if they hated Jesus, they're going to hate us, right? Aren't they? But he was numbered around them, the transgressors. And he says, I was numbered among them on the fulfillment of that. Well, you will be too. Okay? <laughs> So you know what? We live in a world full of sinners. We live in a church that has sinners. And we're numbered among them. Okay? But God's going to help us have victory. Why? He carries our burdens. And he lifts all those things so that we can walk victorious. He provided it all on the cross for us. So it's going to lead me now to communion. You know, Jesus did a lot of things for us. And you know, it's a little time to say thank you. I think. I want to say, you know, it's an opportunity for us to say, thank you, God. And even that, everything that I said doesn't really give it justice. You know what I mean? The cross is everything for us. You know, Peter said this last thing. I'm going to, he also quoted out of Isaiah. And he said this. This is another benefit, Okay. And he even, he even quoted out of Isaiah 53. And he said, while being reviled, he did not, this is 
1 Peter 2, 23 and 24. It says, while being reviled, he did not revile in return. <coughs> while suffering, he uttered no threats, but kept entrusting himself to him who judges righteously. See, he left it to God. See, he wasn't treated good, but he left all of that to God, okay? And, and we need to, too. We got to leave it to God, right? Leave it to Jesus. He understands pain, don't he? Verse 24. He himself bore our sins. There is that word bearing again, okay? Carrying our burdens, in his body on the cross. Why did he do that? That we might die to sin and now live righteously. See? Now we have what it takes to be able to live a righteous life because he took all that load off of us. So now we can walk in this freedom that Christ has given us. For by his wounds, you were healed. And it's past tense over here, not by your stripes. You are healed, like in Isaiah. We're healed because the work was finished at the cross. Everything I told you was finished, and it's all there for us right now. It's there for us. So, uh, Tom, Sue, you want to help me again with communion? And, and I want you to think about this. What Jesus did for you. So I'm going to share... You know, when the Lord at the Last Supper. You got one, Pauline? Let's take a moment and, and just think about what Jesus means for us. You know, sometimes we sing about him, but we don't sing to him. All right? I know I see, there's a lot of songs that I sing about Jesus, but it's a big difference when we sing to Jesus, right? And it's really time for us to say thank you. You know, I could be reading this account right here in the, you know, about the Last Supper, and I could be looking back and thinking about what he did, okay? Thinking about what he did in the past. But you know what? We need to, like, let, let's just imagine in our minds that he's here with us right now, okay? telling us I'm doing this for you and, and we're going to include him in our thank yous for this gift that he said he's going to do. You know what I mean? Let's have that mindset right now. Verse 14 of Luke 22 says this. The hour has come, he reclined at the table and the apostles with him. And he said to them, I earnestly desire to eat the Passover with you before I suffer. For I say to you, I shall never eat again till it is fulfilled in the kingdom of God.
Hallelujah. Thank you, Lord. So, you know, he took that bread. And he's, he knew that his body was going to suffer to provide all the things that I just said that provided for us. He knew that suffering was going to bring life for us. And he had the power and the life to do it, right? And he says, you know what? You're not going to eat from this bread again until it's fulfilled, the kingdom of God. But now we're going to be thinking about what he did for us on the cross, what he did with that body, what he did with his body so that we can be healed, saved, delivered, forgiven. And, and uh, let's partake this bread together. And, and let's take a moment and say, thank you, Jesus. Thank you, Lord. Thank you, Jesus. Then it says, he had taken a cup, he gave thanks. <coughs> he gave this and he shared it among them yourselves. For I say to you, I will not drink of the fruit of the vine until the kingdom of God comes. And when he took some bread, gave thanks, he broke it. And we already talked about that. And then in verse 20, it says, The cup which he poured out for you is the new covenant of my blood. And, and he shed that blood to sprinkle it on the nations so that we could have healing, life, forgiveness. The burden is gone. The curse is lifted. It's all because of the blood of Jesus. Father, I just want to thank you for the blood. And I pray that you bless it. Bless, as we uh, drink this cup, let us think of this, what it symbolizes, what it means for us. It means healing, forgiveness, restoration, life. It means so many things to us, God. And you left it here for us anytime we need it. Thank you, Jesus. Let's partake together. Thank you, Lord. Now I'm going to ask those of you that are on the board, the, the leadership here at the church, I'm going to ask you to come up here and then I'm going to make a plea for people to come. If you have prayer requests, they're going to, they're going to pray with you if you have anything you need prayer for, okay? Whatever it is. Whatever it is, okay?